In terms of environmental issues, the role of psychologists is to examine a variety of topics related to preserving the natural environment. Environmental psychologists study not only how the physical environment affects our behavior, thinking and well-being, but also how our behavior affects the environment. There are social psychological aspects to many of these topics. Violence in jails, weather and altruism, the design of the built environment in relation to crime, privacy, crowding and territoriality. The effects of noise and lighting on interpersonal relationships Spatial arrangements in offices and schools, social aspects of managing natural resources, etc. Let us now look at the dilemmas related to environmental issues. Social dilemmas are situations in which individuals face important choices. In social dilemmas, the rewards to the individual for non cooperation are greater than the rewards for cooperation no matter what others do. However, if most individuals involved fail to cooperate, then everyone receives lower rewards. Three main forms of social dilemma are public goods problems, social traps and resource or commons dilemmas. Public goods problems involve dilemmas about whether to voluntarily contribute to a project which would benefit everyone. Social traps involve short-term pleasure or gain that over time leads to pain or loss. Resource dilemma or commons dilemma are situations in which individuals have to make a choice between self-interest and the interests of the community or of the resource. Hence, these are situations that involve conflict between individual and collective interests. Resource depletion, global warming and pollution can be understood as common dilemmas. For example, in the short term, the rewards for not engaging in pro-environmental behavior are greater than the rewards for engaging in it, no matter what others do. However, if most people act in their own interest, environmental problems will increase, which will eventually be harmful to all. The built environment. Another important role of environmental psychologists is to improve the physical environment. Two ways in which they do so are called social design and defensible space. Social design is a process by which any building may be designed in collaboration with those who will actually use that building rather than being designed solely by a person who will never use the building. This involves designing more humane and user-friendly buildings. One of the pioneers of social design is Robert Sommer. Social design benefits the people who live or work in or visit a building by incorporating their needs and ideas into the design of a building. This process developed over the past four decades is called design or social design research. Social design research involves studying how settings can serve human desires and requirements in the best way possible. Social design is different from technical design. Technical design is the engineering aspects of the building such as the performance of building materials. Soma characterized social design as follows. Social design is working with people rather than for them, involving people in the planning and management of the spaces around them, educating them to use the environment wisely and creatively to achieve a harmonious balance 
between the social, physical and natural environment. To develop an awareness of beauty, a sense of responsibility to the earth's environment and to other living creatures. To the earth's environment and to other living creatures. To generate, compile and make available information about the effects of human activities on the biotic and physical environment including the effects of the built environment on human beings. Social design also may be distinguished from formal design which is the traditional approach. Formal design involves an approach that is large scale, corporate, high cost, exclusive, concerned with style and has a national or international focus. In contrast, social design involves a small scale, human oriented, low cost, inclusive, democratic, the client and a local focus. Therefore, social design research has become necessary in today's world. Its main aims are to re-establish and facilitate communication among the main parties in the design process. A very important role is to remind everyone involved that the everyday building user is one of the main players. Let us now look at the goals of social design. Social design researchers and practitioners have six main goals with some being broader than others and some overlapping with others. The first is matching, that is, Creating physical settings that match the needs and activities of the occupants. Satisfaction, that means habitability corresponding to occupant satisfaction. Change behavior, for instance, enhancing social ties among institutionalized elderly people, reducing aggression in a prison, or increasing communication among managers in an administrative office. Next, personal control. Good social design will provide building occupants with real options to control their proximate environment. Next, social support. Social support is a process in which a person receives care and help from those around him or her. Next, using imagibility. Buildings should be imagible, that is, it should be understandable to the people who use them. It also refers to the ability of the building to help occupants, visitors and newcomers to find their way around without getting lost or confused. Many of these social design ideas apply to outdoor public areas such as parks and streets. Defensible space. Defensible space theory is a theory that deals with both crime and the fear of crime. This theory proposes that certain design features increase residents' sense of security and decrease crime in the territory. Defensible space represents a way of fighting crime with the help of careful arrangement of the physical aspects of communities and residences. Environmental psychologists have developed many theories to help explain things such as who will cooperate and who will not when resources are secure, how cultures vary in seeking privacy, the cultural meanings conveyed by building facades, the strategies residents use for dealing with spatial conflicts within their homes, how children learn to find their way around their neighborhoods and which furniture arrangements encourage social interaction. More crime occurs in taller apartment buildings and in buildings with more than 5 units per floor of 50 total units according to RAND. The reason could be that residents of larger buildings are less likely to know each other and do not recognize 
who lives in the building and who does not. In a way, this makes entry by criminals easier. Let us look at the environmental influences on well-being and behavior. Behavior always occurs in the context of a physical environment. The physical environment plays a crucial role in our thoughts, feelings, performance, behavior and well-being. For example, many people feel uncomfortable in the heat and get easily annoyed by others when temperatures are high. Traffic noise may lead to stress and cardiovascular diseases. Due to suburbanization, people have to commute for longer distances. Work performance shows improvement if the work environment is properly illuminated. Poor building design, noise, water pollution and toxic substances all threaten health and well-being, performance and behavior. The extent to which these environmental stressors affect us depends in part on social psychological factors. The relationship between noise level and annoyance is moderated by social psychological factors. Some environmental psychologists dealing with the built environment contribute to better adaptation of buildings to human needs by advising architects and designers in their work. Environmental psychologists have been involved in the planning stages of construction, formal design, having a special role in evaluating completed buildings and also in determining whether the goals set in the planning and design stages were fulfilled in the completed building. Now let's look at the effects of behavior on the environment. Traditionally, environmental psychologists focused on how the physical environment affects us. More recently, much attention is directed at the opposite relationship. How we affect the environment, for example, through our energy use, water use, vehicle use and land use. The use of fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide emissions, urbanization and building construction reduces farmland and natural landscapes and extinction of some animal species by human activity. Environmental psychologists study such interactions between humans and their physical environment. Environmental quality is seriously threatened all over the world. Some of the most important environmental problems are urban air pollution, noise pollution, shortages in fresh water availability, overfishing of the seas, loss of biodiversity and global warming. Global warming refers to climate change and more specifically to an increase in the Earth's average temperature caused in part by the emission of greenhouse gases, most of which can be attributed to the combustion of fossil fuels. Most of these environmental problems are rooted in human behavior. For example, car use contributes to global warming. The fragmentation of natural areas caused by construction of roads and buildings, noise annoyance and urban air pollution. Consequently, environmental problems can be reduced through changes in human behavior and social psychologists can play an important role in this respect. Environmental behavior can be defined as behavior that changes the availability of materials or energy from the environment or alters the structure. Pro-environmental behavior is often associated with higher personal costs in terms of time, money or effort. For example, for many people, 
Travelling by public transport is less convenient and attractive than driving a car. Organically grown food is more expensive and recycling takes effort. Hence, theories or models that examine why people sacrifice personal gains in favor of the common good are especially promising in the environmental context. Let us now understand the norm activation model. The norm activation model which was originally developed to explain pro-social behavior has often been applied to explain environmental behavior. According to this model, behavior occurs in response to personal norms. Personal norms are activated when individuals are aware of adverse consequences of their actions to others. That is awareness of consequences or AC beliefs. And when they believe that they can reverse these consequences, that is ascription of responsibility or AR beliefs. Self-serving denial is the denial of one's moral obligation to act pro-environmentally and justifying a choice to act in an environmental unfriendly manner. There are four types of self-serving denial. First, people may ignore or minimize environmental problems. Because the severity of some environmental problems is unclear, people may selectively use scientific findings that support their view. Second, people sometimes discount their liability for these problems by believing that their own contribution to problems is small and viewing environmental problems as the result of collective decisions and actions. Instead, they may blame other parties as being responsible for these problems. Third, they can deny their personal ability to perform the necessary pro-environmental actions. For example, saying that no public transport is available and hence they have to use their personal transport. Fourth, they can argue that their individual pro-environmental actions would not be effective, especially in the case of large-scale environmental problems where individual contributions seem trivial. The norm activation model was later extended to the value-belief norm theory of environmentalism by Stern. The VBN model explains behavior resulting from pro-environmental intent. Like the NAM, the VBM theory proposes that behavior occurs in response to personal norms and that personal norms are influenced by ascription of responsibility and awareness of consequences. In addition, the VBM theory proposes that AC beliefs stem from general beliefs about human environment relationships. Values also can affect environmental behavior. Schurz defines a value as a desirable trans-situational goal varying in importance which serves as guiding principle in the life of a person or other social entity. Three general value orientations are usually distinguished. One is the egoistic value orientation in which people try to maximize their own outcomes like power, material wealth when making choices. Another is the altruistic value orientation which reflects concern for the welfare of other human beings. Third, the biospheric or ecocentric value orientation reflects concern with non-human species and the biosphere. The strategies for inducing pro-environmental behavior. Since humans have greater cognitive capacity than animals, it makes 
sense to assume that they can anticipate difficulties and think about their solutions. Given the sorry state of affairs as regards the environment, it is very important that urgent steps are taken to safeguard the environment. Steg and Black delineate four steps to take in the process of promoting pro-environment behavior change. First, choose a specific behavior to be changed that will improve the quality of the environment. Next, examine the primary factors underlying this behavior. Third, design and apply an intervention to change the behavior so as to reduce its environmental impact. And next, rigorously evaluate the effects of the intervention on the behavior and also on the quality of environment and human life. The main actors that underlie pro-environmental behavior are a complex mix of values, awareness of the problem, environmental attitudes, a sense of control, social norms, and attributions about self and others. The interventions fall into two main categories. Antecedent strategies directed at factors that precede the problem behavior. For example, behavioral commitment, goal setting, information, environmental design and consequence strategies directed at the consequences that follow the problem behavior. For example, feedback, rewards, etc. Recycling. Recycling, though less impactful, is easier to adopt and is therefore an environmentally valuable act. A study in England by Nick Burr and Uzel in 2010 examined various factors including attitudes, intentions, norms, personal control, identification with one's neighborhood and self-identity. Attitudes, perceived control, self-identity and norms predicted the intention to recycle and these intentions in turn predicted behavior. Next is getting people to drive less. With the rise of the automobile industry, more and more people now own cars. Due to this, most people like to travel by their own transport. As a result of this, there is more vehicular traffic on the roads, which leads to increasing emission of carbon dioxide, leading to increased pollution. This problem can be tackled by encouraging people to use public transport. Next is increasing home energy conservation. Scholes and others conducted a study of the effect of normative messages in promoting home energy conservation. The rationale underlying these programs is that many individuals overestimate the prevalence of the target behavior but once their misperceptions are corrected, they will engage in less of the undesirable behavior. This approach therefore relies on the influence of a descriptive norm as the actual level of occurrence of the behavior is described. As Schutz and colleagues point out, whereas many of the social norm based programs have been successful in accomplishing an overall reduction in undesirable behavior. Some have produced no behavior change or even increases in the undesirable behavior. Hence, Scholz and colleagues suggested the possible importance of a second type of norm, an injunctive norm, that is, a norm that communicates or defines what is the culturally appropriate and approved behavior? Environmental audits are another approach to home energy conservation. Energy utility companies and governments have tried to induce conservation through programs in which a company representative visits a household and examines its energy wasting capacity. Then the auditor points out problems suggests repairs 
offers an attractive grant for major refits and suggests contractors for doing the required work. Therefore, effective interventions aimed at lowering household energy usage can help in reducing the negative impact of households on the environment. Changing perceptions, cognitions, motivations and norms. Some interventions are aimed at changing perceptions, cognitions, motivations and norms. This approach expects that people will voluntarily change their behavior in accordance with these interventions. The approach assumes that increased knowledge or positive attitudes will result in more pro-environmental behaviors. Most of these strategies can be described as antecedent strategies because they target factors that precede behavior. Information campaigns can be aimed at increasing awareness of environmental problems and knowledge about consequences of various alternatives. Information may be provided about desirable social norms. Feedback consists of giving individuals information about the extent to which their behavior changes have been successful. Another intervention that can be quite effective in the environmental domain is behavioral commitment, that is, a written or verbal promise to perform a target behavior. However, interventions often are most effective when they are combined. Changing the incentives Changes in incentives may be needed in favor of pro-environmental behaviors by means of consequence strategies. Pro-environmental behavior can be made more attractive by rewarding it and environmental unfriendly behavior can be made less attractive by punishing it. Three strategies may be implemented. First, pricing policies can be implemented to reduce the cost of pro-environmental behavior and increase costs for environmental unfriendly alternatives. Second, legal measures can be implemented to check environmental unfriendly behaviors Lastly, the availability and quality of products and services can be changed. To summarize, environmental psychologists study not only how the physical environment affects our behavior, thinking and well-being, but also how our behavior affects the environment. Social dilemmas are situations in which individuals face important choices. In social dilemmas, the rewards to individual for non-cooperation are greater than the rewards for cooperation no matter what others do. However, if most individuals involved fail to cooperate, then everyone receives lower rewards. Three main forms of social dilemmas are public goods problems, social traps and resource or commons dilemmas. Another important role of environmental psychologists is to improve the physical environment. Two ways in which they do so are called social design and defensible space. The physical environment plays a crucial role in our thoughts, feelings, performance, behavior and well-being. Traditionally, environmental psychologists focused on how the physical environment affects us. More recently, much attention is being directed at the opposite relationship, that is, how we affect the environment. The norm activation model, which was originally developed to explain pro-social behavior, has often been applied to explain environmental behavior. The interventions to induce pro-environmental behavior fall into two main categories, antecedent strategies directed at factors that precede the problem behavior and consequence strategies directed at the consequences that follow the problem behavior.